This is the word of the Lord. Thanks for that reading, Mao. We live in an interesting time of tension in the Western world, I think. Our Western culture is steeped in Christian themes. They've just been there through the generations for quite a long time. And yet at a, the subterranean direction of our culture has remained broadly unchanged since before the Christian era. So there's this kind of inbuilt tension, I think, in our culture. And in this uh, book of the Revelation, it's a fascinating and confusing book if you care to read it. In this little section that Mao read to us this morning, we are offered a vision of an alternate structure of power and a very different for frame of meaning. And we're just going to explore that a little bit this morning. And to do that, I want you to be aware of the context. This is a, a revelation that occurred during the Roman Empire. Now, you might not know much about the Roman Empire. Most of what I know I gleaned from watching The Life of Brian. And there's a, uh, <laughs> there's a very good scene in that where the, uh, the people who are trying to resist Rome, they're saying, yeah, well, what the Romans ever done for us? And there proceeds a bit of a, a list. Uh, well, there's the aqueduct. Oh, yeah, the aqueduct, that's pretty good. And uh, sanitation. Oh, yeah, sanitation, yeah, it's quite nice. And uh, there's the roads and irrigation and uh, medicine, education, well, yeah, I like the education, yeah. Um, wine, public baths, public safety, and of course the piece de resistance is world peace. Because in the time of Rome, when Rome virtually covered, its empire covered the known world, there was an extended period of peace that went for about, well, relative peace, about 200 years. And the Roman Empire was able to do that in part because it was extraordinary in building roads everywhere and had a very mobile military force. And they were well trained, the military, and well resourced, and their paved roads meant they could move very quickly with chariots and horsemen and uh, foot soldiers from one part of the empire to another if there was an uprising or an incursion. And they could quash that quite quickly and efficiently. They could quickly mobilize their force and keep the empire strong and peaceful. It was an extraordinarily violent peace, though. Rome enjoyed peace because it was stronger and more vicious than any other nation around it. The military leaders were the emperors, they were effectively the military leaders, and they were worshipped kind of as gods. Rome enforced peace, if you know what I mean. In my living memory, there was a president in um, Indonesia, President Suharto, and uh, he did much the same thing in Indonesia for about 31 years. He used force to keep this fairly disparate uh, group of islands together as a unified nation. And when his rule ended some decades ago, three forces emerged in that country that were jostling for power, uh, the politicians, the military and the religious people. And that tussle at one point threatened to tear the country apart and I think it's still uh, kind of bubbled along underneath the surface to this very day. But when Sahara was in power, there was no evidence of that tussle because he enforced his power by the, the use of military force. That's a very similar idea. And so when people thought of power and glory in Rome, they thought of military force, military power, military glory. I want you to think about the persuasive power of violence for a moment. I know Anne's sitting there going, why is he always talking about violence? <laughs> violence. <laughs> because it's such a feature in our world. And uh, I want you to think about that for a moment. Um, violence has a long cultural history as a persuasive, social, unifying power. 
Uh, do you remember there's a story in the Gospel of John where a woman is caught in adultery and the elders are gathering around and they're picking up stones, getting ready to stone her. And uh, this is a, a way of executing judgment, the way the community could execute judgment. It was an extraordinary technology because it had the benefit of not knowing which stone killed the person. So the whole community was implicated, but no one person was guilty of the murder. It was almost like there was a thing that happened and you participated in it, but it was bigger than you and almost bigger than the community. It was a judgment that came from on high in a kind of a way. Stoning was a community expression of judgment that effectively dispersed the blame for the actual murder so that no individual carried the responsibility. The expression of violence was very persuasive, and I'll tell you why. Not only did you not want to be the victim of that violence, neither did you want to miss out on participating in being the people throwing the stones, because that put you as a sympathizer with the victim. And you wanted to stand with the big group, not with the victim. And that might sound strange to you as you sit here this morning, and I would say that's because you're infected by the gospel. But up until that time, survival meant you stood with the big group who were holding the stones. You didn't stand with the victim, otherwise you would receive the stones. So you participated in the stoning. It was a unifying community expression of judgment unifying the community, albeit at the expense of a victim. We see this precise dynamic when it comes to the universal condemnation of Jesus, the Lamb of God. The Sanhedrin, the religious body, they condemned Jesus and they took him to the Roman authority who was Pilate and he was going to condemn Jesus but thought he'd have a bit of fun first and flicked him to King Herod, the Jewish king in the area, and Herod was fascinated with Jesus, but Jesus wouldn't play along, so Herod gave him back to Pilate, and Pilate eventually pronounces judgment on him because he's the only one who has the power to pronounce a, an execution judgment in that part of Rome. And the crowd gets stirred up, and they cry for blood as well. They cry for Jesus' blood, and there's a kangaroo court and a mockery of justice and all that, and then... His disciples abandon him, and even his closest friend denies him. So the, the narrative is so well written to let you know that everybody in the story, whether an active participant or passively caught up with what's going on, rejects Jesus. They unify in their expulsion of this one victim. So how do we get to this extraordinary sense of reversal? This point where everyone had rejected the lamb, that's why he was slain, and in John's vision, the whole creation is exalting the lamb. Does anything about that seem odd to you? What needs to take place to bring about this radical shift of how we see these things? On the Friday when Jesus was condemned and crucified, people were not anticipating soon turning around and worshipping him. Certainly not as the greatest power in all of creation. The people understood the reality of power. They knew how it worked in the real world and they witnessed it work when Jesus was crucified. That's what power does to vulnerable people, right? In what world could Jesus possibly be the most powerful? Seb, what do you think? Because you probably know this better than anybody else, I reckon. <laughs> well, let's think about this for a moment, and we'll get back to Seb in a moment too. <laughs> it doesn't matter what culture you're from, and it doesn't matter what language you speak. A lamb is not an intimidating creature. 
Quite the contrary, the lamb is the most vulnerable of animals. It has no sharp teeth to speak of, no claws to attack you with. Uh, it has no real defences to speak of at all. They're not even particularly clever animals. They just run away. And the lamb in John's vision is not the lucky lamb that gets overlooked and chosen for the chop. The lamb in John's vision is the lamb that was slain. So this is not a conceptual vulnerableness. The lamb in John's vision is actually the lamb that experiences actual vulnerability and is slain. Are we to believe somehow that being this vulnerable is the most powerful way to be? Is that not more like some kind of twisted form of self-disregard? I mean, think about the world's power structure. It's power over. It relies on fear and intimidation and coercion. It is, in one form or another, an expression of oppression. It might be soft oppression or hard oppression. So how do we get from that sense of power to the power of this vulnerability? And I want to suggest to you that devotion is more powerful than coercion. See, the power of vulnerability is that it opens up the possibility of willing, desirous engagement at a depth that is unthinkable in the world's schema of power. Vulnerability uses no force. See, Seb doesn't force Jen to care for him. Seb doesn't force the groups of young women to gather around and go, oh, how's it going? <laughs> I mean, watch him come into a room and see the power he has. And it is not the power of fear. It is the power of devotion, of attraction, of that smile that engages you and makes you feel good about being alive. This is a very powerful thing I put to you. A very, very powerful thing. I remember when we adopted our kids and we cared for them, not because they stood over us with a stick or anything like that, and uh, we weren't very good parents, so it really wore us out. And a couple of years in, I was talking to a colleague, and I remember saying to this friend, um, it's as though my children are consuming my life, and I wouldn't want it any other way. Because it's a free expression of my love. I want to give myself to them. And I put it to you that that actually might be the most powerful thing in all of creation. To give and not to take. See, rather than a structure that seems to be most powerful, a structure that takes from the less powerful, the world's culture, the Christ culture is about willingly, desirously giving ourselves to one another, to doing that which is good, that which brings life. Not because we have to, not from guilt or any externally placed sense of obligation, but because we want to, because that is where life is to be found. Power that gives a qualitative different, uh, sorry, power that gives is qualitatively different to power that takes. The power of giving is a life-giving thing. That we are, and, it, and it reminds us that we are made in the image of God. There's a sense in which we experience a, a, a form of power that aligns with God's power and it resonates deep within us and our sense of who we were always created to be comes alive in us, I think. We experience immense power in that and it's power to bring life to people. And there is no greater, better, richer, deeper, profound power than that. We not only bless others, but we experience the blessing of being the most fully alive we can be 
and this has an exponential uh, multiplica multiplying of effect of blessing for every person it touches. It's almost like the nuclear fusion of social dynamics. It blesses and blesses. See, when John has his vision of the whole of creation worshipping a lamb that was slain, it is a vision of a transformed sense of what is most important. It's a profoundly subversive text in the context of the empire of Rome. Rather than worshipping the emperor and the empire with its symbols and mechanisms of power over the people, this is a vision that is daring to suggest a completely alternate schema of power. Power that does not spark fear, that does not coerce us, that does not oppress us. The gentle power that invites us. It is the greatest power in all creation. It is the power of willing self-giving as an act of love. It is the only power that is stronger than death and lives beyond our mortal lives. This is the gentle, vulnerable power we are invited to live in now. This is the power of the risen Christ. And I say to you, if that's the power you're into, more power to you. Let us pray. Lord, the vision of a lamb slain on the throne with the whole creation worshipping, it's bizarre. It doesn't make sense. And yet there it is at the heart of your revelation. And you invite us to not only think about, but to enter in and experience and live that power and so change the world in the name of your kingdom. Amen.